Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Jeffs and it's good to have you here today for Tamiki Ergonomics, our inaugural session of Ergonomics 101. Today we're going to take a larger, I should say higher view, if you will, of the landscape in which we find ourselves. These days, a lot is changing and a lot is changing in ergonomics itself. And that's what we'll be discussing and covering today. I want you to remember on our outset, a Zen principle of all things. And that saying is as above, so below, as below, so above. Patterns of truth at one level of reality will be true at all levels of reality. And that's what we'll find here in today's talk and presentation together is how these things overlap. We're talking about something called cope cycles. And what you're going to see is this is basically a project management approach to ergonomics in the 21st century. And as such, we'll be introducing a concept we call global ergonomics. And that means it's based on international principles and standards, but also something that can be used at the individual level in terms of things like holistic health. So everything we apply here is a above so below type of format, meaning that something that applies at a large macro ergonomic view can be applied at a meso ergonomic view, if you will, for enterprises or businesses or, or industry or companies all the way down to a micro ergonomic view, if you'll allow me to use terms like that, meaning the individual as well. As above, so below. As below, so above. Patterns of truth at one level of reality will be true at all levels of reality. So let's go ahead and introduce ourselves as we get our slides moving here. There we go. I'm going to start out with a poll question. And if you see a poll pop up, would love for you to answer these poll questions. We've got about a half a dozen in here. We'll keep them on for about 30 seconds or so. And when you hear the word cope, what I'm asking is what comes to mind? Do you think it's just about putting up with something? Do you think it's about working one's way through a problem? Do you think or feel like it's something about getting by or do you think it has to do with dealing with difficulty and challenges skillful, skillfully and efficiently? Go ahead and take a moment and answer what you think it feels like to you, what it sounds like to you, because COPE principles is part of the cycle we're going to be discussing in global ergonomics. I'm going to give you a few more seconds. Just go ahead and vote. We'll aggregate this information and be happy to share it with you. There'll be no personal information. It'll just be aggregate information. We just like to see where everyone's uh, head is at, so to speak, as we go into this topic. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and advance on. And that is going to include a definition tell we were going this way. When we actually talk about cope, what we're describing is the ability to look at anything with difficulty and deal with it effectively, anything that is challenging to deal with it successfully, to approach adversity and overcome it, endure it, and adapt to it adroitly. But in order to do so, using cope as a verb, it means we need to use cope as a noun, and that is we need to have a strategy or a mechanism. And that's going to be the overarching impression of this time together. Again, the 50,000 foot view, if you will, of the subject matter we'll be describing. In order to do so, we're going to take a little bit of a history lesson in project management. Bear with me. It's just the first couple of minutes. We're going to start with something many of us are familiar with, and that's the Gantt chart. Many of us use Gantt charts in ergonomics and trying to manage multiple things at multiple times. Its history goes back to the turn of the last century, the last uh, 1890s and 1900s. Henry Gantt came up with this chart, and it was first used en masse in World War I. And, um, with mixed results, of course, because if you know anything about World War I, it was a mess. But a uh, general by the name of Crozier used it to try and function with all of the moving parts in World War I. It served us 
somewhat well in certain approaches and not so well in others, which brings us to the middle of the last century, the mid 1950s. And that brought about the Deming cycle, which was a good improvement. The Deming cycle, the PDSA, some call it the PDCA uh, feedback loop, which allows us to study problems in depth and come up with a plan, a hypothesis, and then we implement the plan and watch how it goes. And then probably the most important quadrant in this cycle is studying what we did. So in ergonomic sense, it helps us very, very much when we have all of our known variables in front of us and we're working in a closed loop, if you will, where we control those variables. So we kind of call that in vitro, like in the laboratory. And if we find that we need to adjust, that's the lower right hand quadrant of the PDSA cycle. And that served us well in the middle of the 20th century up towards the end. You may recognize this from lean continuous improvement and something of a lean geek myself. Um, it's a good tool. It's a very good tool, but it doesn't work as well when there are a lot of unstable variables and things we don't know about. At the end of the 20th century, we adopted what's called the Boyd cycle. Some of you may recognize this. This came from Colonel John Boyd, who uh, is credited with giving us the F-16 and the A-10 Warhog and the Top Gun School. And basically, this is what pilots use in air-to-air -air combat, and that is the observe, orient, and decide, and act loop. Meaning we may not have all the variables, but because of the OODA loop, as it's called, OODA, allows us to react more quickly and respond more quickly. And if we don't have things right, loop again very quickly back in to put ourselves in the best position. Again, look at all this from a project management standpoint in regards to ergonomics. What we're doing at Tamiki is looking at the multivariate combinatorial and integrated elements of ergonomics in the 21st century and realizing both of these examples, the Deming cycle from lean continuous improvement, the Boyd cycle from agile and scrum methodologies are something we can use to solve complex ergonomic problems that face us now in the 21st century that are fast moving, lots of variables, we call that cycle the COPE cycle or global ergonomics. And COPE is not just a cute acronym. It stands for cognitive organ ergonomics, organizational ergonomics, physical ergonomics, and environmental ergonomics. And it being a loop allows us to loop through it, to look at what is facing us and always ask ourselves, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? What is the answer? I'm trying to find. And by doing that, it helps us key in on one of these elements or multiple elements of an ergonomic challenge so that we're better able to more adroit, adroitly address those challenges that face us. Within each of these quadrants lies another loop. And this is what we borrow from the Boyd cycle. This fit loop you see here in all four of the quadrants FIT is an acronym that we use that stands for form, intensity, and tempo. And by asking ourselves what doesn't fit here, whenever we're looking at an ergonomic problem, we're able to key in on those things, form, intensity, and tempo, otherwise known as things like frequency, duration, and force. But it gives us a way of cycling through all of these elements. And you're going to see examples of this in this talk together. We're going to loop through every one of these so you can see what it looks like as a whole. And as a whole, we describe this approach as global ergonomics. Now, that's a double meaning. Global ergonomics meaning international standards. So you're going to be up to date on some international standards when it comes to ergonomics, as well as the uh, holistic health. So well-being and health fits into this as well. Remember, as above, so below, as below, so above. Patterns of truth at one level of reality will be true at all levels of reality. So you're going to see how this applies at macroergonomic, mesoergonomic, and microergonomic levels.
to give you a sense of scale, I'm going to present this slide, which is just a, a data set from common US Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics data. You can find this data set. This is just one I, I picked all throughout. And you'll see these four categories show up again and again and again. We're gonna work through each one using the COPE cycle. Remember, these are incidence and illness rates for cases for days away from work. So these are the most expensive injuries out there, and I'm calling these macroergonomic trends. As you see, we'll walk through it and we'll use the COPE strategies to address what are cognition problems. And I'll explain contact with objects or equipment and why it's so. Also organizational problems, and I'll explain how slips, trips, and falls fall into this category, as well as physical problems. This is the one that probably brought you here today and how we address that. And then finally, the environmental problems. And the environmental problems that, that, we conf that confront us and how we can address all of these categories using that COPE cycle, using that combination of Deming and Boyd cycle to solve our ergonomics problems. And this will set the groundwork for more of our webinars to come ahead. This is not a prescriptive webinar. This is an overview. And as we have more of these webinars, we'll dig deep into these different categories. But I'm going to give you a loop through all of them. Before we do, let's start with this next poll question. So I'm going to give you a few seconds there. And if you will, I'd like you to ask yourself, when you hear cognitive ergonomics, what comes to mind, so to speak? Pardon the pun. Do you think of things like sharpening your cognitive focus with uh, meditation or broadening your creativity with guided imagery or deepening your proprioception with tools like self-hypnosis? Or do you think of things like mental processes such as perception, memory, reasoning, motor response, that sort of thing? Let me give you a few more seconds. If I had the um, Jeopardy theme, I'd hum it to you right now, but uh, you don't want to hear that. Take a few moments, go ahead and put it down. Remember, this is aggregate data. We'll collect. We're happy to share it with you. No uh, personal information is on it. All we're doing is getting a sense of where everybody's beginning and starting. So with that, we'll go ahead and go into our next section, and we will begin with lower left hand quadrant of the cope cycle global ergonomics cognitive ergonomics what do we mean by cognitive ergonomics what does that look like and how is this an international standard well remember we always ask ourselves what is the problem we're trying to solve so if we turn to the national safety council the national safety council here in the u.s points out that we have a very distracted workforce we have a problem with inattention. We have a problem with lack of focus and distracted workers. And what that looks like is contact with objects or equipment, which used to be called struck by objects or equipment. A distracted worker may walk in front of a moving forklift and get struck or reach their hand to something without thinking first and getting a pinch point or step off a ladder without realizing they're not at the bottom rung yet because they're distracted and or pull a box down not checking to see if there is something above them and all of it coming down on them. These are all examples of contact or struck by objects or equipment. We're going to make the case that these are cognitive ergonomic issues. So when you see contact with objects or equipment or struck by objects or equipment, the first thing you want to ask yourself is what are the pro what is the problem we're trying to solve here contact with objects or equipment has a lot to do with the distracted workforce. All of us know we carry around these devices now that ping and pop and bu buzz and vibrate and pull our attention away from the present moment. And that's known as a smartphone either ironically or unironically, but it is and as a result, the task switching that goes on the neuroscience now tells us that it's eroding our attention span. And I don't mean only when you're staring at it and scrolling. I mean, task switching tends to erode attention span. So you start to see these recalcitrant, hard to treat cases of contact with objects or equipment where you ask yourself, where was this person's head at when this happened? We have tools we use that we won't go into in this particular webinar, because again, this one isn't a prescriptive one. We're just mapping out the territory 
but we do use tools like breath work and movement and warm ups to help people sharpen their focus in their day to day work. Now we didn't pull this out of thin air. This is what the, the International Ergonomics Association describes as cognitive ergonomics, that it deals with mental processes such as perception, memory, reasoning, and motor response. And this is something that you can see right from on their website. What you're looking at right now is a screen grab from the International Ergonomics Association website. And if you'll notice, they've got ergonomics split up into three categories, the top one being cognitive ergonomics. Again, dealing with perception, memory, reasoning, and motor response. If someone is not completely focused on the task at hand, they're at risk for a macroergonomic injury. And once we identify one of those factors, we look at how do we drill down? And that's where the fit loop comes in. So this is our first example. Remember, we're practicing what we preach in this webinar, that we loop into that and we look in a little further. FIT, as I mentioned earlier, is an acronym for form, intensity, and tempo. So what does that look like when we're talking about cognitive ergonomics? Well, the form of the issue might be decision making or attention and memory issues. The intensity might be workload. Maybe somebody is carrying too much of a workload as they're trying to get through their day, and that's what set them up for the macroergonomic injury. Or is it a tempo issue? Do we have an automation problem going with that they're just not keeping up with? Maybe it's training and skill. All of this is a point of entry to look at that broad category of exposures and deal with it effectively. We're noticing that in our work in AI supported ergonomics, and we look at, well, how can we address that with the tools we have at hand? Would we roll, um, <laughs> roll out the ruler, uh, which is more of a position and posture type of approach and say, maybe this is something we should address, or perhaps the fatigue in index. And that's more of a tempo issue. Maybe it's something where we're wearing people down because of their workload. We work our way through this fit loop to give ourselves the tools we need in order to be able to address this sort of thing appropriately. Which brings us to our next poll question. This one, when you hear the term organizational ergonomics, what comes to mind? Is it finding the right place to work? Is it finding the right tool to use? Is it finding the right time to work for a specific task? Or is it organizational structures, policies, procedures, processes, and that sort of thing? Take a few moments, go ahead and uh, work with the poll, and uh, we will give you a moment or two to, to uh, vote. There it is. And we will proceed in just a moment. I'm going to take a sip of tea. Well done. We'll move into our next quadrant now and answer the questions we just brought up. So in the next quadrant of the COPE cycle, organizational ergonomics is a lens we look through as well. We always ask ourselves when we're confronted with an issue, what is the problem we're trying to solve? What is the answer we're trying to strive towards? Let's look at the National Safety Council again. They claim, this is from their website, in 2021, 44,000 Americans died from, from falls and, at home and at work, 850 in 2021 at work, and hundreds of thousands were injured badly enough to require days away from work. Remember, these are those macroergonomic trends, those days away from work injuries that are so costly. So when we look back at our sample data set, we see slips, trips, and falls. Why do we have so many people slipping, tripping, and falling? We're doing all we can to control the work environment so that that doesn't happen. But I'm gonna make a case for you here that it's not merely about the work environment. It's about the workforce itself, and that's an organizational issue. You see, we have an aging workforce. To give you a sense of scale, 
when there was a generation turnover from the World War II generation to the boomers back in the 70s, the average worker at that time was in their early 20s. Here in the mid 2020s, the average worker is in their mid 40s and the age is growing. What's that about? Well, what we have now over the past 40 years is a situation where people don't have pensions anymore here in the US, they have a 401k and that's tied to the stock market. So many people of a certain age group and of which I'm one have seen over the past few decades, booms and busts in the economy every decade, every single decade for the past four decades. What does that look like? That means you look like you've got a good retirement going and then there's a bubble burst and suddenly it loses its value and you have to start over again. People are not completely comfortable with when it's safe to retire. And as a result, we find people holding on to their jobs longer and longer. And this cohort that's in their mid or upper 40s now is actually many of them started in blue collar work and advanced into white collar work. As a result, they may have put on a few pounds, they may have gone from a very physical job to a very sedentary job. And if you don't use it, you lose it when it comes to vestibular function and proprioception and kinesthesia. So what used to be a stumble becomes a fall. And we see that a lot. And so a lot of these macroergonomic slips, trips and falls has to do with an aging workforce. The good news is if you use it, you lose it, but you can gain it back. So one of the approaches we'll take, and again, we'll dive into this in another webinar, is how do we make sure that our employees, if we're giving them, say, a warm-up series and slips, trips, and falls, how do we work balance work into that as well so that they maintain that proprioception and kinesthesia and vestibular function? It is something that can be regained. And According to international standards, as I mentioned before, the International Ergonomics Association describes organizational ergonomics as organizational structures themselves, policies, procedures, processes, and how we interact within a system. So we look at things like task allocation and teamwork and leadership and communication skills and organizational culture to help make sure we're driving these exposures down. This you're looking at is that Venn diagram. Now look in the lower right hand quadrant and you'll see organizational human factors and ergonomics is represented as well. Things like communication and teamwork, participation and cooperation. These are all things that we have to consider. And if we identify it, remember asking ourselves, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And we identify, you know what, this may be partially or fully an organizational issue, then how do we address it? And that's where our OODA loop, so to speak, comes back, that Boyd cycle. What is a fit loop we could look at? What doesn't fit in this scenario that I'm seeing where we're having so many of these slips, trips, and falls? And again, fit is an acronym that stands for form, intensity, and tempo. So is it a workload distribution problem? Maybe the intensity is too high for a certain workforce or a shift or a crew that's working. Maybe it's a task allocation issue and we're not dividing things evenly. Or what form does it take? Is it a communication issue? Is it an organizational structure? Looping through these questions, using FIT as an acronym, what doesn't fit here? is the way that we're able to dig down a little deeper and find those problems that may be difficult for us to locate and allocate. So again, if we're using our tool, our comprehensive risk analysis tool, we're gonna ask ourselves, should I look at this through the lens of one of our assessment tools like the fatigue index? Maybe it's a tempo problem. Maybe it's frequency and duration and we're just pushing the envelope too much and this is what's causing this kind of exposure. Or maybe we would rely on our snooks tables. This is another assessment tool in our suite and focus on intensity. Is there a lift, carry, push, pull, pinch or grip issue and force generated that might be at the source of this. Giving ourselves these different questions to ask, ask allow us to drill down deeper.
which leads us to our next quadrant and our next poll. And this poll is when you hear physical ergonomics, what then? And this, do you ask yourself, does this mean optimizing physical aspects of work? Does this mean design and arrangement of workstations? Does it mean addressing factors like posture and movement? Or does it mean anatomical, anthropometric, and biomechanical characteristics? Go ahead and vote, we'll give you a few seconds, and then we'll move on. We'll collect this aggregate data, we'll share it with you, we'll give us all an idea of where we're starting and where we're going to in this discussion and further webinars that drill down, we'll get more prescriptive in upcoming visits together. So with that, we'll move on into the quadrant that probably brought you here to begin with, and that is the upper right-hand quadrant of the COPE cycle, that's physical ergonomics. So let me just pause for a second and explain why the cycle model works so well here. And that's because with a cycle, you can choose that as your point of entry. You can jump on the carousel anywhere you want and jump off anywhere you want. So if you look at an issue and it's like, well, I don't know if it's a cognitive one, I'm not sure if it's organizational, but I sure know it's a physical problem that we're facing here, then we'll go ahead and drill down in that area. And as you know, this is the one that probably brought us here today. Physical ergonomics is where we often start. That's why the cycle works so well. So when we quote OSHA and ask ourselves, what's the problem we're trying to solve? OSHA is telling us 1.8 million workers report musculoskeletal disorders. In 2018, there's that number, 45 to 64 year olds had the higher and highest incident rates of everything. Like I said, it's an aging workforce. Even with the organizational, you see where these things overlap. And in 2019, 47,000 cases were recorded of MSDs, and over half of them resulted in ER visits. So that's the big macroergonomic trend you see on the left here in our data set that overexertion and bodily reaction is probably the one that brought you here. We call it strain, sprains, aches, and pains. But this is a classic ergonomic injuries that we've always seen and wrangled with for years and years now. And again, looking through the lens of global ergonomics, looking through the lens of international standards, the International Ergonomics Association is telling us, yes, it's concerned with human anatomical, anthropometric, physiological and biomechanical characteristics as they relate to physical activity. So if you're thinking along those lines, you're in the right place. And this is where we look at things like posture and movement and repetitive tasks, lifting techniques and biomechanical stresses that workers may be under. And yes, of course, it's represented in the Venn diagram in the lower left-hand corner here, of human anatomy, physiology, anthropometrics, and biomechanics. So the classic uh, ergonomics, as I always say, the ergonomics from the last century is still here with us. And if we, uh, if these were only engineering problems, we would have solved these long ago. But these are more people problems, as you're discovering in this talk. So when we look at our upper quadrant and we ask ourselves to loop through, just like the Boyd cycle, to give us a mechanical approach to this, what doesn't fit here? Always asking yourself first, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? We saw OSHA telling us why. And then also, what is the portion of this process that I'm looking at that doesn't fit? In the term of physical ergonomics, what is the form? So form often means posture in this regard. Is this person in a stooped posture? Are they standing too long? Are they sitting too long? Is there something that's feeding into this? What if, if it's an intensity pro problem? What if it's force that they're having to lift, carry, push, pull? Or how about tempo? Are we pushing repetition too much or long, too long a duration? Cycling through FIT as an acronym, form, intensity, and tempo, allows us tighter and tighter OODA loops to find the answer we're looking for. This is the tool that we use. And in the tool that we're using with AI, we're looking at our assessment tools that are built into our system that are predictive and saying, maybe 
If I'm looking at this problem, I might use the REBA because it's an entire body assessment and I can look at position and posture and get a good sense of the relative risk. Maybe we use the NIOSH lifting equation if it's more of an intensity lifting issue and we'll get our measurements there and we'll use them in pre and post. That's the beauty of this type of approach is that we have beginning and end and we can loop through with our assessments. This is where AI is changing the game because it's predictive and it's iterative. We can loop through the exposures and we can do befores and afters and not ones and dones. Many of our clients with Tamiki use these assessments again and again and again and actually gamify it and actually have workers say, you know, show them and say, look, you had a 99 score on that lifting task. Today, we just looked at it again, you're an 86. What could you do to improve it? Because if you've ever done as many back schools and things like I've done over my career, one and done doesn't always get it. People start out well, and then there's a deterioration rate, and you can actually track that and improve upon that with the tools we now have at our advantage. So that leads us to our next poll question. Question number five, when you think of environmental ergonomics, what comes to mind? Do you think about optimizing the interaction between workers and their environment or how temperature and lighting affects their performance or design and modification of their work environment or the study of specialized environmentals within a system? Take a few moments, go ahead and vote. And again, aggregate data is what we'll pull together. And if you're interested in that data, we're happy to share with you. And don't, for, don't forget, none of this is personal information. It's just aggregate. But we'd like to get a sense of where you're coming from and where you're starting as we move through the rest of this talk together. So physical ergonomics is probably what brought you here. And now we're moving into environmental ergonomics, the lower right-hand quadrant of our OODA loop. And that is environmental. Down here, we look at the things that are part of the environment around us, that in vivo, if you will, approach to ergonomics. It's great to look at the three big categories of cognitive, organizational, and physical, but we also have to look at in what environment is this person working in and how is that affecting us? We ask ourselves, as always, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? And what are the answers I'm seeking? When you do that, you can look to OSHA again. And OSHA explains to us that environmental risk factors are things like cold and humidity and wind and heat and temperature and radiant heat, clothing, and even workload. I'm, I'm, I love that they mentioned metabolic rate because that plays into this as well. People have different tolerances. And when we look at our data set of exposures, what we have left after the three big ones on the left is an aggregate of environmental factors. Now here they listed things like transportation accidents or injuries by persons or animals, heaven forbid, violence, but we're also talking about all those other environmental factors as well. And when we call on the Journal of Applied Ergonomics, they describe environmental ergonomics as Environment within a system, how people deal with it, the light, the noise, the heat, the cold, the fumes, the dust, the pests, all of that affects something we can't ignore, and that is the environment that our workers work within. Now, if you'll notice, the Venn diagram I've been showing you from the International Ergonomics Association does not include that fourth loop, and it should, and I'll explain why and how in a moment, you only see it mentioned in the lower right hand corner there. That has to do with just within the International Ergonomics Association. But I'm going to make a case that we can't ignore this because again, when we look at the environment, we're really seeing how people operate within the atmosphere in which they work. And we can fit loop this one as well, asking ourselves the next logical question, what doesn't fit here? So when we look at things like the form things might take, like humidity or lighting or noise, we might also look at the intensity. 
Is it unbearably hot where they're working or frigidly cold? And are we preparing them for that? Do we have the right kind of gear for them so they, they can operate properly and not become one of these other injuries out there? Also the tempo, are, are, they, are we, again, pushing a little too hard considering the environmental factors as well? Now, I wanna just add this little wrinkle to the discussion the person that lobbied for that being uh, the fourth loop in that Venn diagram is none other than our esteemed and august colleague, Dr. Alan Hedge. And I'm, I'm not plugging myself here. I'm just saying we've done a very informative webinar series, podcast series with Dr. Hedge, where he discusses some of these things. And he was one who came to bat. He was actually the chair of the International Ergonomics Association and explain this to them. You know, the Deming cycle is great. It helps us come up with a hypothesis, test the hypothesis, hypothesis, study our results and make adjustments. But that tends to be a, a closed loop and it tends to be an in vitro situation where we know all the variables and we're controlling all the variables. But remember what we described earlier about the Boyd cycle, that in this day and age, in the real world, there are a lot of things coming at us very quickly, and we may not have all the variables controlled. And that's where in an in vivo situation, in other words, in real life, in real time, we were called upon to come up with rapid responses, and they may not be perfect. And that's where drilling into the fit loops, the smaller categories allows us to drill down in a systematic way and look for the exposures. So when we look at these macroergonomic trends, and we remember our COPE cycle, we realize we have the tools to address all of these data sets that when we have contact with objects or equipment, we can utilize cognitive ergonomics to come up with interventions that help people focus, work on their breath work, especially if we're doing a warm up with them. Why wouldn't you not only have them warm up their body, but also warm up their mind and get focused for their work. There's a way to overcome distraction. We teach that in other classes and seminars. Also, what about those slips, trips, and falls? If it's an aging workforce issue, we can address that as well. In those warm ups, for instance, as an example, we can utilize things where they, they work, focus on balance in part of their warm up series. We've done that successfully as well. Lastly, when it comes to physical ergonomics, do we make sure we warm them up in the physical sense as well? Not only relying on warm ups, but all the things we've just described. And then finally, in environmental settings, that we have all the tools ready for us too. This is how we take a global view and a large view, but have all the tools to drill down sequentially and find the actual problem we're trying to solve. That's what COPE looks like. So to reiterate, remember, Gantt charts are great. I'm not putting them down, but they had their day in the first half of the 20th century and they did good. We're still using them and they're still useful in certain areas. But when we get into ergonomics, we have to look at drilling down and answering problems for us. And that's where Edwards Deming helped us with lean continuous improvement and said, look, you have a plan, do, study and act cycle that you can use to root cause what's confronting us and find exactly what it is we need to solve. From there, we built on that. And from lean, we went to more agile and scrum type of approaches because we realized we're dealing with moving targets here. We're dealing with a complex, multivariate, and combinatorial world, and we need to be able to recognize synergies and synchronies and syntheses to be able to be predictive. That's where the AI helps us. By ga gathering this data, we can start to become predictive. And why do we want to become predictive? Of course, that's what gives us leading indicators. That's what gets us upstream where we're solving problems before they happen, rather than reacting to them afterwards. And when we drill down a little more, we get into that broad category of global ergonomics and then start to ask ourselves the fit question. That is, what doesn't fit in this particular example?
So every one of these quadrants has an approach to ask ourselves, what's the form? What's the intensity? What's the tempo? And which of these or a combination is causing these type of macroergonomic injuries and trends? Again, coming back and remembering as above, so below, as below, so above, patterns of truth at one level of reality will be true at all levels of reality gives us the tools to be able to work from the macroergonomic to the mesoergonomic to the microergonomic approach, meaning we have a fitness and wellness approach, but we also have a larger approach for companies and enterprises. We also have a big picture on how we deal with things. We call this global ergonomics, but it's based on this cope cycle as well. And now in the 21st century, with the benefits of AI, we're able to become predictive and look at, should I apply an assessment that will gather this information that I can compare in iterative loops, looping in, should I use the Reba for addressing form and posture or the Rula for form and posture? Should I use the NIOSH lifting equation for intensity and force with lifting at, uh, uh, activities? Should I use the fatigue index to address tempo and frequency in a particular task? Or should I use the snook tables? Remember, these give us relative risk. When we understand relative risk, we can compare before and afters to our intervention, and we can continually iteratively loop. By doing so, we don't suffer the one and done deterioration that often happens when we teach everybody to lift correctly, for instance, and then we find out a week later everybody's back to doing things the way they were before. Uh, many of us have confronted that sort of thing or had it confront us in the work environment. So giving us these tools allows that multi-level approach to drill down, starting with the big macroergonomic view and working way all the way down into microergonomics. So to finish up, I have one more poll for you. I want you to ask yourself in this poll, feel free to answer, what do you hear? When you hear global ergonomics, what comes to mind? Do you think of cognitive ergonomics and struck by objects or equipment? Do you think organizational ergonomics when you look at slips, trips, and falls? Do you think physical ergonomics when you're confronted with overexertion and bodily reaction? And do you think environmental ergonomics when you see things like transportation incidents or heat-related exposures or fumes or dust or lighting? All of these things come into play. And when we understand that we live in a multivariate, combinatorial, and integrated world, realizing that helps us to become predictive, to look for synergies and synchronies and syntheses. And by doing so, we have predictive tools to move way up into the leading indicator space and cause these problems to stop before they ever occur. We start reactive, but we move into preemptive and preventive and protective types of measures, which is the, always the goal of environmental health and safety, always moving upstream. That's the difference between the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things. So remember, COPE is not just a cute acronym. It literally means cognitive, organizational, physical, and environmental ergonomics. And it also means that you deal with difficulty effectively. You deal with challenges successfully. You overcome adversity and endure and adapt adroitly. And by doing that, you have to have a strategy, a mechanism, a method. What we've done is adopted the best of the Deming cycle in lean continuous improvement, the best of the Boyd cycle in Scrum and Agile. We use those methodologies and we come up with a way to apply these to ergonomics with AI tools that drive this type of improvement home, always moving upstream, always being product predictive and finding emerging properties before they emerge. So that's kind of the source. As I said, today's talk is an overview to see a way of applying these great tools, these great methodolo met methodology tools that have been around for almost a century and apply them to 21st century ergonomics and apply AI
and able in order to do so. So with that, that's our talk today. Now, I have uh, been given some questions that some of you have been writing in and asking us about, about like what's the best evaluation tool to use in given situations. And that's where those fit loops come in. You can ask yourself, if I'm gonna use, uh, look at, for instance, form, I might rely in, you know, in posture, I might rely more on Reba and Rula. Those are the tools that give us a relative risk score for the bending over and the kneeling and the squatting and all kinds of postural exposures. Why don't I start there and do before and afters? And then what about if it's a lifting issue? What if it's something that's intensity and people are moving through their uh, work? We might use the NIOSH lifting equation in our software platform to be able to identify that we've got some issues that we need to score and also improve there. What about if it's a tempo issue and we just have too much frequency going on and that's what's fatiguing people? Well, we have the fatigue index. Every one of the assessments we have built into our software and our AI support helps target us with those fit loops as we described before. And lastly, what if it's an intensity issue and it's not just lifting, maybe it's carrying and pushing and pulling and gripping and pinching? Well, it's the snook tables are built into our system as well. Choosing a before, choosing an after, and then an intervention in between is how we can test ourselves in real time. It used to be that we carried around a clipboard and we burned a lot of cognitive fuel just filling out a Reba, just filling out a Rula, or thumbing through the Snooks tables. Now we have that automated, which means we can do it quickly. We're hearing back from our clients who are telling us they're doing this in a gamified fashion, where they're actually saying, hey, look, you did a 98 on your best rep. Let's use that as a model, and we'll come back and loop through again. And that way we won't get that deterioration of, well, we taught you how to lift. How come you're not lifting the way we taught you? You have to reiterate. The, the, the days of just one and done in ergonomics, I think we found is mm, modest at best. So with that, uh, that's one of the first questions that I was presented with here in our talk. Um, another one, let's see, I've got some Q&A here. Let me pull some Q&A over here and see what some of you have uh, asked about. It sounds like ergonomics analysis nowadays is more like a corrective approach. Yes and no. Uh, what about preventive and predictive? Well, that's, I hope we addressed in this talk. We're, we're actually finding ourselves in a way we can move ahead of things. In the manufacturing environment, how do you recommend ergonomics analysis to be applied from the design stage? Excellent question. And these kind of tools can be used in that way as well. We, we can use them in a laboratory-like setting, if you will, in, an in, in, uh, in vitro, as I had mentioned earlier and practice these things in a way that's before we design and say, is there an exposure that we're finding as we work our way through and, and using relative risk in our tools to compare how we're performing. I have another question here, another good one. Is there an assessment where the walk path is shortened, but the workload is, um, doesn't really change? Uh, another good question. Uh, in that regard, we would e examine the location itself and may or may not use one of our tools, or we may. We might decide that um, this is a factor we'll look at as well. And then there's an uh, anonymous attendee who said, can you give an example of an aggregate data from a physical ergonomics level and applying that information at an organizational level? We can, that would be a deeper dive. I'd recommend reach out to us and we'll show you how the, the tool is apl applied that way as well. The idea is to become predictive. And at first we're reacting, there's no doubt. It's always kind of been that way. We're always striving towards the design phase, as mentioned earlier, to where that we're not relying on just that. Uh, oh, hi, Chantel. She's calling in here. Tamiki A will be used for virtual ergo assessments or simply manufacturing and industrial. Excellent question. Yes, that's another thing that we're finding. 
This tool is very useful in remote settings. So we're putting together right now a training program we're calling the Champion Program, the Tamiki Champion Program. And it involves, Chantel, to answer your question, it involves being able to use participatory ergonomics. For those of you who are familiar, participatory ergonomics has been around 40 or 50 years as well. And this is a way of showing people on site how to use the tool and applying it and gathering data for us. And then we can do the intervention phase, walking them through the hierarchy of controls or whichever elements you're going to use to come up with your interventions. And yes, you might can also use it for people capturing their own movement and then sending it to you and moving the video through the software as well. So it's designed to be used that way, Chantal, and that's a great question, to be able to utilize the tool anywhere. So you, you, if you do the upfront training to people who are on site, they can be your data collectors. And that allows us, we're already using it that way in Tamiki and several of our clients around the globe where people are doing that to remote places. They're capturing the video and then the software is making the Reba or Ruler or whichever assessment tool uh, determinations. And then the ergonomist can make suggestions based on those determinations. And then you try them in the field, you take another video, you loop through, and you slowly tighten up those loops and close those gaps. It's, in a way, it's gap analysis, classic ergonomic analysis, where you're looking for the gaps and you're looking for one, a way to use reasonable accommodations as we use, to lower the exposure, the work requirements, but also improving the performance of the worker at the same time, in a sense, closing that gap as well. Uh, another attendee says, what are the practical strategies for integrating physical ergonomics principles into workplace design and task performance to prevent musculoskeletal disorders? That's another discussion for a deeper dive that we're actually building into our system to where on the front end, in the design phase, we can help you work through these problems before design ever happens. Again, once you're capturing, it might be role playing, it might be actually having people work through different tasks, videoing it, and then coming up with our invent interventions and looping through as I described before, closing those gaps. Ultimately, these are all different ways of using gap analysis in a way where we have predictive analytics to help us in that. So I hope that's uh, helpful to you. And um, anything else? Uh, we've got a few more minutes here together. I uh, got another one. How does training and education fit into COPE, COPE cycle? That is actually where we've positioned it in our champion program is actually on the front end because that is a cognitive task to begin with. Now it'll work into full body requirements and full body practice. But on the front end, we put that particular approach, the training and education in the cognitive portion where we put together training programs on the front end and then test them throughout the loop, if that makes sense to our anonymous attendee. Excellent question so far. The COPE cycle is designed, like I say, as a broader OODA loop, if you will, the Boyd cycle, so that we can work in real time, but also in the design phase has been asked here, when we have control of our var variables, we can then use the similar to the PDA cycle. So every element of the COPE cycle coincides with both of those cycles. When you think of cognitive, think of plan in the Deming cycle, think of observe in the OODA loop. If you're in the organizational, think of the do or the application, think of the orient in the uh, Boyd cycle, always looping through throughout the cycle, they all overlap one another by design so that we can switch from one to the other or use all the above to be able to basically aggregate and integrate all of these approaches. So we're looking at things from macro view and a micro view. If that makes sense. Any other questions with the few moments remaining? Got a few moments. 
And uh, otherwise, I'm going to lead you in some stretches. So watch out. We'll do some warm ups together. Here are some more. OK, uh, in what ways does organizational ergonomics influence employee performance, satisfaction and overall organizational effectiveness? Excellent question. So when we have different types of work groups, when we have things to consider like task allocation and teamwork and organizational structures, we have to understand that we're dealing with human beings, of course, and we want to be able to make sure that we come up with an approach that everyone can do. I'll give you an example. So when I'm called on from major employers, there's about 50,000 employees in the US right now doing a warm up and stretch program that I designed. And what we do is we look at uh, the room. I, I call it reading the room. So if you're implementing these things, you're reading who can accomplish the task and who can't. It's something we use in group fitness as well. And whomever is having a little trouble in the background, they're the person we key in on, not pointing them out, never embarrassing someone, but finding out where the, the sticking points are with them. And our goal is always to make them successful. So often in, like I said, the exercise or warm up programs that I designed for tens of thousands of employees around the US, we have a graded system. We have a very simple in beginner program that or process that develops into an inter intermediate that develops into an advanced. And that way we can bring people along. And if there are some people that just cannot perform the advanced, we have grades that they can perform. So that's one of the ways that we'll use organizational ergonomics to influence those employees' performance and satisfaction. I'm glad you brought up satisfaction because that's a big one as well. We want to make sure that people feel that they're part of a, a progressive system, so to speak, something where their employer cares for them. And we're doing everything we can on their behalf. I hope that gives you a little bit of inkling of some of the things that we do. And is there any more? We've got a couple of more minutes here. Uh, happy to answer any more. And uh, here we go, end of webinar feedback. So how did we do today? Go ahead, give us a, uh, a uh, honest iteration, an honest goal. Remember, this is a big picture view and we'll drill in, into more prescriptive things in our webinars to follow. So go ahead and feel free to vote. And, you know, I, I probably didn't cover everything. You probably have more questions and I welcome you to reach out to me. You can always find me on LinkedIn, uh, which is where I tend to spend my time in uh, social media. So you can find me there, you can, uh, let's connect. And then if you have follow up questions where I can drill down deeper for you, I'm more than happy to do so. Uh, more questions, where do we find your stretch designs? Well, those are actually with <laughs> actual employers. Uh, and I do design them specifically for work groups and job titles. We actually go out, we analyze the job, we look at the exposures and we come up with custom designs for them. So I don't have a blanket program, so to speak. The, the internet's full of those. But what we do is we pull together a program that's specific for a work group or a department or a job title or any of the above. So feel free to reach out to me and I'd uh, be happy to uh, discuss that further with you and give you some idea of how we develop that sort of thing. Anything else with a minute or two we have remaining? So good to have you. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. And uh, be by all means, reach out to us here at Tamiki, where we're happy to uh, share our ideas with you and uh, come up with ways that uh, will be most beneficial. Do stay tuned for upcoming Ergo our webinars where we will dig deeper. I'm not the only speaker here. We're gonna have other speakers who come and drill down in some of these much more deeply, much more profoundly. And if you have questions, we may be per somewhat prescriptive. We may give you some ideas of some design and how you might be able to solve some of these problems because uh, we're all in this together.
Uh, lastly, thanks, great subject. Looking forward to more to come. Thank you, Scott, that's very kind of you. We appreciate that. And um, with the few moments remaining, take a moment, take a deep breath, exhale. Remember the key to taking a deep breath isn't how much we draw in through our nose. The key to taking a deep breath is how much we blow out from our mouths. If you extend your exhale, you shift your autonomic nervous system towards the rest and digest branch and you focus the mind. Remember, we have all kinds of techniques to reduce the distraction that we're finding uh, with the um, struck by objects or equipment. And with that, the hour is up. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Brittany. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, all of you. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to discuss any of this in more detail as you see fit. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Folks, thanks so much for your time and attention. And uh, we will see you on the next one. Take good care and be, be well. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.